Conversations with the Inspiring Minds Using design and creativity towards social change This is Design for the People with Greg Bondry Hello and welcome I'm your host Greg Bunbury and on this show I'll be speaking with the designers, artists, creative thinkers and activists using their skills to tackle social issues, uplift communities and make a difference in the world. And joining me on today's show is Nosa Igbenadian. Nosa is a British Nigerian filmmaker, editor and motion graphics designer. His short films have won multiple awards and played in festivals around the world including Raindance. In 2015, he received the Rising Talent Screen Nation Award. Nosa's work is dedicated to creating speculative fiction rooted in African culture, mythology and perspective alongside contemporary social issues. From dystopian virtual reality to African deities battling in London, his films are a collision of grounded realism and stylized fantasy. Nosa's passion for comic books and superheroes and his interest in African spirituality and philosophy led him to conceptualize the rise of Orisha series, perhaps the first African superhero film years before Marvel's Black Panther. The BBC and BFI recently commissioned Nosa to write and direct the short film Binge Watching for the BBC. This was science fiction as social commentary, exploring some of the issues faced by the black British community today. As a cross-platform creator, Nosa is currently developing projects for film, TV, VR, and a graphic novel. Nosa, welcome. Hey, how are you doing today? I'm good, sir. How are you? Good, good. I'm glad to be here. Happy to to speak to you. Thanks for being on. Um, We met when you first released your Rise of Arisha film, and I had the pleasure of doing the poster, uh, and we connected through a mutual friend, the late John Daniel. So it's great to be able to pick up the conversation with you now. We're a few years in and kind of just process some of the the things we've seen, some of the movements in culture and your work, of course. So just to kind of get the the listeners engaged in your story, um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started as a filmmaker and your journey so far? Yeah, yeah, of course. No problem. Um, So... Growing up, I always wanted to be one of two things, either a filmmaker or a an astronaut. And I studied um, astrophysics in university um, for some time. And, you know, part of the reason why I studied that was because of my goal was to try and find new worlds. That's really what I wanted to do deep down. Um, probably inspired by watching too much Star Wars and you know, a lot of, um, <laughs> a lot of sci-fi growing up and, but, but going through university, I realized that, you know, the academia sort of side of it was all going to well, but it was in some ways at that time, I feel quite limiting in terms of, um, I felt that a lot of my lecturers didn't see the speculative things that I saw or weren't interested in it. They were interested in what's real, what's provable, um, and what we can get a grasp on. So that kind of naturally led me to losing some interest in that and finding more interest in worlds which I could create. And that's kind of how I got, got into film properly. So after sort of like doing astrophysics physics for a couple of years, I decided to, you know, just stop, take a year out and then decided to do film. Um, which was like a 360 and people were looking at me like, what are you doing? This is, this is crazy. Um, but yeah, I, in my mind, I was like, okay, you know, eventually, you know, there may be, there may be space tourism and I would be Ooh. able to get to space, you know, in other ways. But right now I'm like, film is a place where I can just create different worlds. And, and essentially that was the reason why I got into it. Um, studied it for a bit. And then again, um, I think I probably have a problem with academia because I was studying it and I was kind of like, oh, I'm not making enough films. So um, I wasn't making any films on the course, actually. I was actually just, you know, um, it was very sort of theory based. And I was like, okay, Mm. I need to make some films. So got together some uh, equipment, some film um, stuff got together a few of my friends as crew and we made a, a shot which um was very successful went on to win um the Brit black filmmaker award that nadia denton i don't know if you know her 
um, yeah, yeah, yeah. used to run. So I went on to win that. And then from there, I kind of got an internship at Film 4. Uh, I got a scholarship in the US and it started to just broaden my perspective and my horizons when it came to film. So, so yeah, in a nutshell, that's how I got into film initially. And did you always start from science fiction? Because in a tradition of black filmmaking, especially black British filmmaking, our roots have been in neorealism with films like Horace Ove's Pressure, which was uh, 1975, and then Franco Russo's Babylon, 1980. Uh, black British cinema up to this point has always been rooted in a kind of a, a, a very realism style. Um, but you, as far as I can tell, are one of the few black working science fiction um, filmmakers. So did you always start off wanting to do sci-fi or was that a, a progression? Yeah, I think it always was something which I wanted to do. Um, it was initially, I felt that some of the, so the first film, which I mentioned, which um, I did in, in, in uni was actually a film noir. So it was a film noir, but it was set on um, an estate. So it kind of like took all of the tropes of film noir and then just kind of uh, placed it with people uh, and kind of remixed it up a bit. But for me, I was always, I don't know, I, I, you know, the, the music I liked, the art I liked were, was always sort of people who were popular, but were trying to do something which was outside of what was already done. And that's something that I always aspired for myself as an artist. So um, I would say deep down, I was always like, okay, I want to do sci-fi. That's what I want to do. But initially, after making that first film, I felt myself for the next couple of shorts go down a path where I kind of felt like I catered a bit to, you know, what was expected. Right. You know, a lot of a lot of the film bodies uh, in the UK, you know, a lot of them support filmmakers, which is great. But then I think a lot of them have a lot of sort of like narrow focus on exactly what type of films can be made by British filmmakers and also by black British filmmakers. And mm. a couple of years into doing that, I kind of sat back and I was like, I can't see myself doing this for like 30 years, for 20 years or whatever. I was just like, I was like, no, I can't. And what I really want to do is I want to make like all of the stuff that's in my head. Um, so eventually it was like, okay, I want to make a film that's based on stuff that I just love. And I don't care who likes it or who says I can get a green light. I'm just going to make it. As soon as I did that, I feel that that was a turning point in my career. And that was when, you know, I felt things were really taking off. And, um, and that was a lesson that stayed with me, you know, like whatever you're doing, no matter what everybody else says, if this is a movie that you truly want to make, just go out there and make it. Yeah. And I think it also speaks to, um, what's expected of black narratives, especially in film of yeah. this, uh, films about inner city life or yeah. the urban experience or, uh, violence or crime. So in yeah. a lot of ways, by making that pivot, we empower ourselves to tell stories in a different way. And this connects to a lot of your filmmaking later on, which deals with philosophy and spirituality, but it gives us a wider canvas to paint with. And it's not to say that the films that deal with realism are less valid. It's just, we have a wide experience and you know we, we need to make all these tools available for us in terms of storytelling. Um, how did you find the industry in terms of representation when you first started and how did you navigate those hurdles? Um, whoosh. It's interesting because a friend of mine um, went to the NFTS, National Film and Television School, and became kind of like a, a lecturer there and was able to... Um, to connect and lecture and it's essentially you run a group for, you run a group, uh, a film education group for a bunch of people in a, a bunch of different areas, a bunch of young people in a bunch of different areas, um, from the ages of like 13 up until 18. And, you know, you, you have sort of like London, which is, you know, very diverse ethnically, but then you have outside London, which is, 
not. But then after sort of like teaching people from around the country, he kind of had a, uh, he had an understanding of the, the stark differences between people and just their perception of what was possible for them. And it made me reflect back upon myself because growing up, you know, we never had anybody like none of my family members and I didn't really know anybody who had been in film. You know, it wasn't something mm. which initially was accessible uh, to us um, per se. Like there was a few of us sort of like coming, coming up sort of working and stuff, but it wasn't like, few years ago, it wasn't as accessible. There wasn't as many people doing stuff. There was a few people, maybe um, Horace that you mentioned or um, mm. Menelik, Shabazz or, you know, people like that doing stuff. But like black British filmmakers, you know, mm. I, I didn't know anybody really. But I think, I don't know, like I think we kind of at the same time that, that that kind of inspires me because it was like okay yeah no one's really doing it right now um or maybe they are they are but we're not really sort of hearing about them so that's a gap in the market and mm. you know let's go and attack that gap as, as hard as we can so I think that yeah like I always like I don't know I've always just looked at it and if anybody can do something regardless of you know where they're from or whatever, it can be done and I can do it. And I feel that that's kind of like the attitude to have to sort of make stuff and progress forward. Um, mm. But then at, on the flip side, I can also see the benefit of having a dad who's been in there or just having someone, you know, who's there, who can show you the directions and navigate. And there are a lot yeah. of people who, you know, sort of coming up, you, you see, oh snap, okay, your dad's dad, was the director on this, this and that. And you're like, okay, I can see how you've sort of maneuvered your way in here. Um, it is what it is, man. But, you know, I think we just all have to find our way. And if what you bring to the table is something completely fresh, completely new, because you haven't been in the industry and you haven't been heard, mm. I feel that now is the time when, you know, that voice can come out, you know, like there's no barriers now. Maybe there were 20 years ago or 30 years ago, but now right. I think those barriers are being eliminated. So I think that's a really good point in terms of anybody listening to this who's aspiring to make film is by looking at those barriers and seeing them as opportunities instead. And by looking at those uh, kind of sticking points and seeing them as niches rather than something that's working against you. So you lean into your identity and your history, and that gives you something extra, which in a lot of ways makes you unique in the marketplace. Um, and I think this is a good segue into talking about how your culture has uh, played such a fundamental role in your work. Uh, so, yeah, I would say that, you know, going back to, you know, when I sort of made the shift and like, you know, I've done a couple of these social movies. I ain't going to do no more of those, yeah? That, that was when, <laughs> that was when, like, I, I sat down, I had a long sit down and I said to myself, you know, what do I truly love? Like, what do, what, you know, when I was 10 years old, what really got me excited? And, you know, the two things were superheroes and the stories which I had heard um, uh, from Nigerian culture growing up, you know, mm. about, um, you know, kings and the emperors and the gods and all these sort of characters, which I was like, okay, um, I grew up sort of watching movies like Jason and the Agonauts and stuff like that. Yeah. And that cool. growing up, you know, and, and then getting older, you start to see movies like Thor, you start to see like these myths being represented on screen. And to myself, I was always like, why am I not seeing the myths of the stories which I've been told, like, as a child sitting down, listening to, like, these stories of, like, you can see in your head, uh, so fantastic and vivid and magical. And you're just like, if I can paint that on screen, if I can paint what I've seen in my head on screen, like, you, you it hasn't been seen before, you know? And... 
I think for me, like that, that, that that's really just like just a driving force. It's just passion, you know. Mm. Um, and at the end of the day, I kind of feel that um, in terms of culture, we always look at culture as we always look at culture and tradition as something which is quite static. So mm. wherever we're from, you know, we consider it to be something that was set by people back in the day. But for me right now, I, I, I sort of look at it as we're part of a, a patchwork of, you know, um, people telling stories, people building culture. So if we are in this generation, we should be adding to the culture which we've been given and, you know, not just sort of consider it something which is passe, which is backwards. Um, and I think it's incumbent upon us to, you know, wherever we're coming from, wherever stories we have, uh, to find ways to bring those stories up, but also to find ways to modernize those stories and make them relatable to the world. Because it's only through kind of like just sharing our, our different stories that we all start to have a shared story and we become more of a connected unified world mm. very far from yeah. it right now but that's you know the pipe <laughs> dream well you know there's been progress there's been progress for sure so let me ask you this this is might be uh kind of a curveball but with regards to culture and specifically with regards to african culture um when we first met this was a time before black panther this was a time before uh beyonce's black is king um how do you feel about Westerners or people who are further away from your uh, ethnicity, but still from the uh, Afro-Caribbean diaspora, appropriating elements of your culture or your folk stories in terms of telling their stories. Well, yeah, I told you it was a curveball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I love curveballs, curveballs. Um, uh, I mean, like I, you know, I think like I just said in, in, in sort of like, as I was finishing off the last kind of diatribe I went into, um, <laughs> the, the goal is for us to all have these shared stories and for all, for us to be able to share these stories. That's why they call called shared stories. And, you know, the re one of the, one of the main reasons why I got into film was because you know, I can sit down and I can watch a movie about an orphan in Argentina. And for that moment, I'm transported into that orphan's world. And I sort of understand that orphan's world a little bit. Um, so I think sharing those stories is really important across different cultures. Um, and I think especially, I, I think especially when it comes to sort of like, African and African Caribbeans, I think there is a lot of similarities, you know, like mm. if, if, if you're taking, um, the rise of the Orisha, for instance, yeah, it was only after like I, uh, did that film that I realized that the Orisha or the African spirituality or spirituality of African descent, um, was shared by many different sort of people around the world. And, you know, I would learn that people who were um, hearing about, for instance, Shango, the god of fire, the god of thunder, sorry, mm. um, that people in Brazil, Afro-Brazilians, were being told very similar stories, but in, in Portuguese. And then hearing about people in Cuba being told very similar stories and then starting to realise, oh, actually, when it comes to like Black people, we're a lot more connected then we actually yeah. take grant when we realize. So, I mean, when it comes to that level, I feel when it comes to black people sharing stories from different parts of the diaspora in Africa, I'm kind of like, let's do it because, because, you know, it, it's unifying one, but also it, we, we're already more unified. We are unified through these stories. So why not? Like, why break it up into little, why balkanize everything? You know, I feel. Yeah it's an opportunity for me. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, let's, let's, let's share these stories. Let's um, tell each other stories, but, but uh, obviously I have to put this disclaimer so that, you know, people don't um, rip my heads off. 
you you do have to make sure that if you are saying something specific about a certain area or place, you know, you, mm. you, you show respect, essentially. Mm. Um and, and you do your research and so forth. But um but again I think other than that, you know, we have so much to to come together over that that shouldn't be an issue. Yeah. No, I second that. I mean there's so many Caribbean um folklore that's originated from Africa. I think it's the uh, Obia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah, yeah, correctly. Yeah, 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 but yeah. like in Guyana, we have the Jambi and um, we have uh, all of these stories that when you do, when you research them, you find that a lot of their origins are rooted in African culture. So there is a lot of connected tissue there in terms of storytelling. Um, since you leaned into it a little bit, can we talk about Rise of the Orisha? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So, I mean, one of the things that struck me is watching it again. So this is, uh, I guess, four years later, three, four years later, um, is how how much, uh, I don't know, similarity, but how much DNA I saw in, say, the Black Panther film in terms of the styling. I'm not saying that Marvel... You know, <laughs> I wonder Marvel Marvel's check. <laughs> <You too. laughs> I wonder, no, I'm playing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, what were your thoughts in terms of how you began that project and from a visual sensibility? Because there seems to be so much now that's kind of geared towards that aesthetic and that style. Yeah, I would say that, you know, where. In regards to the sensibility visually that, you know, I kind of, I guess, developed around the Rise of the Orisha projects, um, it was always sort of reaching into a well that, 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 that's super deep because it's thousands of years of culture. So whether you're talking about, um, just the, the, the aesthetics of, say, Oya, who is the god of, um, wind, and her colors, purple, red, and so forth, like, um, these are archetypes and, mm. uh, you know, really deep, you know, uh, ancient archetypes. And I feel that, you know, I, 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 again, going back to, to what I said, I feel that, you know, I was tapping into something which kind of lives in our collective unconscious, you know, like Joseph mm. Campbell talks about that sort of, you know, Thing that we all share. Um, so the fact that say somebody like Marvel or whoever else is sort of working within this kind of space kind of drew on similar things makes a lot of sense mm. to me, you know, that it, it comes out sort of like there's a similarity there. Um, because really like we're, 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 we're standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, where, mm. where, we're reaching into like these deep, this deep well of storytelling. Um, and I, yeah, I, like f for me, I don't have, like, I remember when, when I first did Rise of the Orisha, um, I had certain people who first came to me and were like, um, bro, are you sure you want to do that? Like, are you like, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like a couple. Wow. I, I, I had a few people and then I had a, a, a couple of like, um, people even from Nigeria who were like, ah, oh, I don't know if you want to do that. Like that's, uh, that is, that's the, the non demonic thing. Like, and I'm thinking to myself, hey, this is, and this is you, it came from your, you came from y'all. Like, yeah. So I'm thinking like, it's deep, you know, sort of like we can go into that <laughs> later on, but there, there's a lot of sort of like <laughs> mental things going on with, um, just African people uh, generally, but, mm. But um, I always counted it was with like, you know, you guys don't know what you're talking about. There's a massive like uh, desire for this. There's a massive Ooh. desire for this. People want this um, because it hasn't been done. And because there's so much that we have within our culture that, 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 that sort of like speaks to this, like Storm taps into that, for instance, you know, Ooh. Iron Man, Ogun, God of Iron, taps into that whole thing. Mm. So for me, it was like, it was always going to be there. And, you know, Marvel doing Black Panther coming out and doing sort of 1.5 billion sales was vindicating. 
to that yeah, yeah. to that fact. For those who haven't seen the film yet, um, what's the? Can you give us a brief summary? At the moment, it's two films. Uh, one is a short film. Uh, one is a um, is a web series. Essentially, the idea was to take these ancient African deities called Orisha and to represent them uh in the modern day as as superheroes essentially and uh the first film was about a young woman who has been sort of taken by this villain and we have Oya who is the deity of wind and change and tornadoes uh mounts which is another word for possesses a a a a a, a woman called Adesua who uh upon being possessed by her has you know amazing powers and physical abilities and goes on a mission to go and rescue this young lady who we know as the key um but in doing so doesn't get the results that she expects to get and essentially it's a it's a taste of for a wider kind of universe so within this universe you have just like uh you have um different a pantheon in um egyptian or roman or greek mythology Mm -hmm. you have gods of thunder you have gods of change you have gods of iron of of love and so forth and what I'm doing right now, like initially I started off, as you know, um, Greg, that sort of off of that taste star, it went viral, did like, um, initially did a few hundred thousand, um, views, uh, collectively in the different channels. It's about a couple of million right now. So wow. it really kind of like, it went off and, and spoke to a lot of people. Um, and then off the back of that, I started working on a feature film and a few TV ideas, um, as well. So they feature different deities within the whole sort of pantheon. And what, I, what I'm really excited about with this is that, you know, uh, as an artist, I get the chance to play with a lot of different things. So, you know, there's, um, like, like you mentioned, like I mentioned, there's, um, a god of goddess of action and a warrior goddess. Oh yeah, essentially mm-hmm. a warrior goddess, the goddess of change and hurricanes. Um, and her storylines are a lot more sort of action orientated. But then you have like tricks the god that gods, like the god of um god uh called the god of crossroads called Elegua um or Eshu. And you know, kind of similar to, you know, if, you know, I think from the Caribbean, you may know sort of like, and Nancy's a similar analogy, analogy to that. Yeah, with yeah, Ghana. Yeah. Ghana yeah. would know Nancy is that kind of tricks the God. So when I, you know, when I think of him, I think of the stories I write are dark comedies, you know, with still with a superhero element, but you know, the genre changes a little bit. So for me, uh, as I'm working on it, it's, it's an interesting sandbox because there's a lot of different kind of tones and genres that I'm working with. So, so yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, I've been hard at work at a lot of stuff on this um, as well. So, yeah. No, that's awesome. And, you know, not just with the storytelling of um, Black Panther has vindicated what you're doing, but also shows like um, American Gods, which uses uh in a similar way uses the convention of using mythology to tell very modern stories basically um so in terms of using storytelling to uplift culture and also tackle social issues you also made a couple of short films which were more rooted in science fiction um one was binge watching and the other was you me i and these films have a slightly different, a slightly different take, but they still have that same DNA that's, that's clearly made by the same filmmaker. Um, how did you approach those projects? Uh, okay, I'll start with Yumi Ai actually. Um, so uh, Yumi Ai was is, is like a sci-fi romance. Um, it's about a couple. It, it follows a couple during one day at, at breakfast. Um, set in the future, 
uh, you have like sort of a see-through touchscreen um, tablets, uh, super-powered AI that controls the house. Um, and it's essentially about their relationship in this, in this new age. Um, and for me, like, I'm very into, uh, I'm very into where we're going, you know, like, mm. you know, you hear a lot about sort of, um, for instance, especially as a, a, a black person, uh, African person, like you hear a lot about African history, you know, mm. constantly. And, you know, there's a lot said that, you know, there's a lot spoken about that says that, you know, we need to have more African history. And, and I, I don't disagree with that. But then I also think that, you know, a focus on African future, you know, there was, um, there's a guy on, there's a guy on Instagram. I'm going to send you his details, actually. Um, he's a musician, but a futurist musician. And he did this song called There Are Black People in the Future. And it's just like, it has like a backing track of Martin Luther King saying something, but just sort of like the way he says that phrase, it seems so simple, but mm. at the same time, it's like, because we don't get as much visions of ourselves in the future, how do we know where we're going? And how do we know when we got there, whether it's good or bad? How do we navigate if we don't set a course? So part of mm. my thinking behind some of these futuristic films, you know, which will be representative of where I'm coming from is charting that course is saying, okay, um, how is London going to look like for a young, uh, 20 something black male in 20 years, you know, yeah. going yeah. where we're going right now. So essentially you, me, I essentially, it's, uh, you, me, I was about relationships and it, it, it also drew on, you know, my own personal relationships as well, uh, which, yeah, watch the film. <laughs> yeah, no spoilers. No spoilers. Don't, <laughs> don't say too much. If you haven't seen it, uh, there'll be links to everything in the show notes. Um, but yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, that drew a lot on that. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about binge watching. So binge watching, short synopsis is about um, a young privileged white woman gets to have a VR experience and see through the eyes of a young black man going through stop and search. And the where, where, where that sort of came from was um, a few years ago, I was in uni waiting for a bus with my girlfriend, um, police car pulled up and got out and asked me what I was doing here, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and when my girlfriend says she wants to go home, like the last bus is, is, is coming, they were like, um, shut up. And I was like, excuse me. And then they pushed me and it got into a mad scuffle and uh. it's thrown on the ground, roughed up, thrown wow. into like a, a, a bank, bank door. And they were like, oh, we're going to do you for that, mate. And I was like, you, you guys are mad. So anyway. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, I got arrested and I had to stay overnight in a, a cell. They didn't charge me for anything. So the next day I came out uh, and then we went to go and press charges at the IPCC, which is the Independence Police uh, Complaints Commission. And when I got there, uh, the commissioner or the guy who was there was like, um, yeah, yeah, sounds really bad what happened. Um, yeah, we have checked the cameras in the area and apparently they weren't turned on at that time. And I was like... <laughs> I've had the exact same thing. Like literally the exact same thing. Separated by like a decade or two, but the exact same thing. Oh no, the cameras weren't working. Wow. Yep. Yep. Unbelievable, wow. isn't it? It's, it, and, and I mean, I guess, you know, at that point, and you probably, it's kind of like, you know, but in my mind, I was also thinking, I'm, I'm still alive. So, you know, I'm going to take that one and, and keep it moving. Um, and just keep that in my heart. But 
this was like a, I think this was a couple of years before the whole BLM movement really took off. So for me, like I was looking at it and I, in seeing sort of like Philando Castile and all these people sort of getting mm. gunned down and murdered um, on TV, on TV, on the internet, on video, made me reflect back to that incident. And I said to myself, you know, I questioned, you know, how would it have turned out if I had like a camera in my hand at that point in time and there was like a network for me to push this out to? What would have happened? Um, so it was really coincidental that the cameras weren't turned off and that allowed them to get away with a crime. But then all these crimes were being reported. But then the issue for me is all these crimes were being reported, but then they were still getting off. <laughs> so it was like, yeah. <laughs> it was like, okay, um, it, it, what, what, what are we doing here with the, 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 this imagery? Is this imagery serving a purpose or is it for some people just, just um, torture porn for them to just look over and post online and act like they actually give a you know? And mm. I guess all those things were, were, were things which I was thinking about when I sort of made binge watching. So, um, so yeah, wrote it, um, and I guess to speak for, for, for where we are right now in terms of the times, I took it to, um, took it to the, to the BBC and BFI and they commissioned it. And I didn't think they were going to commission it really because it's kind of like, you know, um, I guess in a way sort of anti-establishment and it's talking about the media and it's, you know, yeah, sort of sure. raking on that. So they got commissioned, uh, and, uh, yeah, it got put out there and, you know, had a really big reaction from people. But again, I, it's interesting because when you put it all out there, you don't know if it has served the purpose that you meant it to serve or if it's just being reinforced by people watching it and having the same reaction the lady in yeah. the video had react, had. If you, you, you know what I mean, you see yeah, it. So. Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, what I love about it is uh, you're essentially using content creation as a means of creating narratives. So as uh, black creators, often in terms of media and in terms of uh, the situation we find ourselves in, we don't have control over the narrative that's being fed to us through media. But by using art and design and filmmaking and creativity, we can shape these narratives. So whether the narrative is positioning Africa rather than it being this kind of typical view of Africa as this developing nation, we can view Africa as a progressive built up urban environment it's 54 countries you know and by having the uh having the ability to imagine a progressive technological africa as opposed to this uh, quote unquote developing nation um we get to shape that narrative and then in terms of binge watching we get to shape the narrative of bringing people into how stop and search feels and the impact of it but kind of doing it in a way where it's still entertaining so it's you know when we spoke of the kind of the uh traditional realism of british black uh cinema in the 70s and 80s we're still taking these themes and we're taking these content concepts but we're portraying them in a way where it's still engaging and it's visually amazing you know, I'd love to see more of that. I'd love to see more creatives and filmmakers uh, shape narratives and challenge commonly held ideals about the black experience in this way. Um, one bit that I want to ask you about binge watching and uh, you, me, I is the symbol. Uh, oh, so okay. the, the cloud symbol with a kind of a kanji character in the middle. What's the, what's the thinking behind it? Um, yeah, pretty simple. It's, um, I've sort of, so what I do is I'm not essentially just, I don't see myself as just like a filmmaker. I see myself as like a world creator. Like I, when I sort of think of stories, I think of the whole world and that really drives, um, I'm a world builder essentially is, is mm. what I sort of work in, work on. And um, in this world, there, that symbol is a connective uh, tissue for all of the different worlds that I have that's in this future world kind of thing. Yeah. 
So the symbol is a symbol of a company called Sorinet. And I'm going to be doing different. So I'm working on a feature right now, which is an expansion of, um, it's almost like an expansion of binge watching, but then also an expansion of UMI it kind of meets in the middle between them. So basically, uh, I'm going to be doing a bunch of films which have, um, this company, but in different time zones. And a company isn't always necessarily, um, instrumental to the narrative, but it kind of like, is like a bookmark, like, Hey, we're in the future and this is where we're going. And also it's, it's also branding as well. It's branding as in, this is my vision of the future. But this is the advantage well, so. of long form so, yeah. storytelling is that we, you have time to build worlds and you have time to build environments and you have time to build, um, connections between stories. And that allows listeners to engage with it on a thematic level. Uh, in terms of uh, standalone content or as one wider body of work. If you were to speak to any kind of inspiring filmmakers right now, what would you, if you had to give them kind of three main takeaways, what would they be? Mm. See, I was going to say something which would just be completely trite, like work, work, work. But, but um, you know, I don't think that's a, a, I don't think it's a bad starting point because one of the things about your story that's interesting is that your progression comes from working. So you have the theory side of film and then you have the practical side of it where, you know, in order to get better, you just, you just have to start doing, it. you just have to start shooting. You just have to start putting your content out there. And I remember these sentiments echoed by Tyler Perry in terms of him talking about his beginnings and his theater work, where it's just, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to put on a show and I'm just going to keep doing it until someone stops me from doing it. You know, whatever you have to, he didn't kind of sit around and study theater design for, you know, 10 years before getting into it. He just got in the mix and started trying things. Yeah. Yeah. No, I a hundred percent agree with that sentiment. I think, you know, yeah. I think the first, yeah, the first thing would be fundamentally, you know, work. Your work is essential. And if you haven't made anything, it's so easy to just, you know, go out and make, make something. So if it means, you know, taking your, your phone out and making a film, you know, it's just consistently doing it. That's how you're going to get better at it. That's how you're going to get your name out there and, you know, get sort of like, build up connections, build up sort of a fan base and so forth. So yeah. Um, and then I would say for two others, I'd say firstly, the power is with the creator, the creators right now. Um, you know, you create something really, um, you know, you take the first bit of advice, you create something really um, interesting and pair that with a little bit of understanding of how, you know, to spread your message. And mm. like, you got dynamite right there. You've got gold. You can create your own freaking career. You don't have to re rely or depend upon anybody. Um, and yeah, like, and, and I'd say third, just um, make sure that whatever you do, it, it's what you want to do, not... Um, you know, don't try to make something to please somebody else because, you know, I'm talking to, I'm talking to, to, to people right now in different sort of like, uh, for instance, you know, talking about doing different movies and so forth. And these people that I'm talking about, talking to, um, are tired, like, and I'm talking about gatekeepers, but I'm also talking about fans. So I'm just talking, to, you know, they're tired of the same old, same old, you know, this is why, mm. you know, Netflix and Amazon are popping off because, you know, people want something new. And if you are a hundred percent you, you are a hundred percent unique and nobody can copy that, you know, that's your own brand, you know, just be you. So just make what you want to see, what you really want to do. And, uh, you can at least be happy with what you do, you know, and yeah. you're more likely to be yeah. successful as well. Yeah, I I totally agree, man. I think that's um, very valuable 
very valuable words of wisdom, not just for filmmakers, but for any creators really who are looking to make their mark and build their own content without having to rely on a gatekeeper, as you say. Um, so yeah, that, that's awesome, man. I really appreciate that. Um, so what's in the pipeline for you? Yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, so I'm working on this, this, this feature. It's going to be a sci-fi. Um, so I'm working on two features. One is sci-fi set in the UK and another is a sci-fi, uh, movie set in, in Nigeria. So, um, working on that. I'm also going to be shooting this March slash April, um, the next installment of the Rise of the Orisha, um, franchise series. So, I'm going to be so going. So we've had um, Rise of Arisha, Rise of Umoja, and this yeah. is the third one? Hey, this is going to be the third one. Um, so it's going to most likely be based upon Ogun, who is the god of, of, of iron and um, technology, which I guess is the one I feel most kind of connected to for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, so I'm planning to shoot that out in Nigeria as well. Um, wow. And yeah, and, and currently just working on um, uh, a TV show for a streamer, which um, I'll inform everybody. I'll let you know when that when, when that's sort of ready. Um, and yeah, like just I'm just trying to make as much cool, interest, interesting stuff um, cross platform uh, that I can, um, and you know, just trying to you know add myself to the growing voice of interest in artists who have got something new to say um in this world so yeah well you've definitely done that bro um uh your work is amazing it's uh progressive every time i turn on the tv and i see something like uh i don't know the bbc's uh noughts and crosses or game of thrones i think man where's no sir where's no sir i'm waiting for, i'm ready man i'm ready for this uh i'm ready for the african game of thrones um, See you coming, um man. <laughs> so yeah uh your work is brilliant and i hope everybody listening um can take some time out to check it out uh where can people find you what's your website uh www.nosa-filmmaker.com or um nosa Egbenadian, um on instagram and twitter it should be the same thing as well awesome well we include those links in the show notes uh my thanks for nosa for joining us today um and yeah look forward to seeing more from you bro thank you it's great to thank you for having me um and yeah it's a pleasure to talk to you as always and yeah um i can't wait to see it wicked man all right thank you take care yeah see ya my thanks to nosa for joining me today uh, his work is a fantastic example of what happens when we use these mediums to create new narratives and push the envelope in terms of the content we create for more episodes of the podcast, visit bunbury.co forward slash podcast. That's B-U-N-B-U-R-Y dot C-O forward slash podcast. And join me again next week for more inspiring conversations with the creatives making a difference in the world. Thank you. You've been listening to Design for the People with Greg Bunbury.